Okay. Yummy in the tummy, like my granddaughter would say. Did everybody enjoy lunch? Okay. On the count of one, two, three, I want Troy and all the team to know how much we appreciated their wonderful service to us today. So we're going to do You Rock. Okay, are you ready for that? On one, two, three, You Rock. Once again, one, two, three, You Rock. Burp, excuse me. That was so good. Okay, how are the people in the lobby and outdoors enjoying the sunshine? It's time to re-engage. We're going to talk about sex. <laughs> and I'm not talking about gender identity, okay? Let's just, let's just get past that whole thing. So all those folks in the lobby who can hear my voice, we're watching and waiting and hoping you'll come back and enjoy this afternoon together. And as soon as Dr. Molina is back in the building, we'll get started. Okay, I'm gonna give you uh, two minutes to just kind of chill and settle, and then we'll introduce Dr. Molina again, okay? While we're waiting for Dr. Molina, I just wanted to kind of give you a little update on our efforts at the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association and Samaritan's Purse in Ukraine. Um, thanks to the wonderful support of many of you, how many of you have filled a shoebox for Operation Christmas Child? Wow, almost everyone in the room. Well, in 2021, we collected 11 million shoeboxes for Operation Christmas Child. Well, it took us months and months to collect 11 million shoe boxes. They were collected in churches and then taken to regional distribution centers and then finally arrived in Charlotte uh, at the airport where you have this huge facility. All of those shoe boxes have to be inspected, each and every one of them, and uh, verified and certified for uh, their delivery. And we work exclusively through local churches all around the world. So. It takes months and months and months to collect those boxes, but you can imagine you can't just deliver them overnight. So uh, Franklin and uh, Jane's youngest son, Edward, who graduated from West Point and served as a Green Beret major in the United States Army for 15 years before coming to work for Samaritan's Purse. And by the way, with Memorial Day coming up next weekend, Anyone who has served in the U.S. military, would you please stand to your feet? Take a look around you, folks. Thank you for your service, all of you men and women. Praise the Lord. So Edward uh, finally got the... Dad had been asking him to come to work for him for years and years and years and said, Dad... You know, that's great, that's great. And then his brother, Roy, told him, hey, you know, if Dad's asking you to go to work for him, that's one thing. But if Jesus asks you to go to work for him, that's an entirely another thing. And he reminded him about the story of Peter when, you know, Jesus called him out of the boat. Well, guess what? Edward that night had a dream about Peter getting out of the boat and said, okay, Dad, Jesus is calling me. I'm coming to work for you. We put him in charge of Operation Christmas Child, and guess where he was in February distributing those shoeboxes? Ukraine. 
working with 3,200 churches in Ukraine with their pastors, getting those shoe boxes to the kids in Ukraine when the Russians invaded Ukraine. Dad, what do you want me to do? He got on the phone and said, well, get your butt back, oh, excuse me, get, your, get back to, um, to Charlotte and get our DC-8 and put a, one of our mobile hospital units and fly to Poland. Let's help with the refugee crisis that's going to happen. So we flew our first medical hospital over to Poland, uh, but there wasn't a refugee crisis. Thousands of people were getting out of, of uh, uh, Ukraine each and every day, and the Polish people just opened their homes and started welcoming the mothers with their children and, and the elderly into their homes and caring for them and feeding them. And so, um, we, uh, because Edward had been working with these pastors, we flew another medical team and hospital to Poland and then trucked it to uh, Lviv inside of Ukraine. The mayor allowed us to uh, occupy the lower floor of a high-rise uh, concrete parking garage right across from the train station. And we've been there uh, for a long time and have deployed four other medical clinics in Ukraine. Please pray for the people of Ukraine. I know you are doing that and I pray that you'll just continue uh, there are many agencies in addition to Samaritan's Purse and Billy Graham Evangelistic Association that are helping there. But I just wanted to give you a little update and tell you that uh, God is at work. Would you please help me welcome Dr. Molina? Hallelujah. Amen. Are we on? Are we not on? There we go. Super good. Well, sometimes they... Uh, make me the keynote speaker right after lunch in a lot of these Stand Courageous meetings because nobody could get a wink after I get on the, bo on the stadium here, on the stage. But, but uh, we're going to enter into an aspect of the relationship. Um, there are so many aspects, um, so many expressions. I'll tell you, just uh, uh, when I got married uh, to Yvette, um, my mom decided to visit us, you know, when we were all settled in and had a couple of children, and so mom decided she'd pay her uh, matriarchal visit. And so she came in, and I was newly married, and I wanted to impress her with the house we had, and the children, and working hard, and, and watching Yvette um, be able to, to take her post and, and do what she was supposed to do as a young wife. And, and my, my mom came over, you know, she, she came into the house, and she started making observations um, she comes over to me and she says, son, could we talk a second here? Uh, I need to tell you something. And, and I said, sure, mom, what's, what's, what's going on? Um, she says, I notice your wife doesn't know how to cook. <laughs> and this is a Christian woman, spirit-filled. She's a Bible teacher. Uh, but, you know, the devil was using her that day. <laughs> and... Yvette was aloof. She, she didn't know what was going on. She didn't know that there was an enemy in the house. <laughs> so I, I, I overlooked it. Uh, I said, Mom, you know, maybe after she's married 30 years, she'll know how to be a gourmet cook. Well, it's been 28 years, and not only does she know how to cook, she's an amazing, amazing, um, amazing expression of gourmet meals uh, right before Nick got married which you met and his wife uh, she brought out her best I don't know what she was doing she's trying to get Melissa to find out uh, now that Melissa has her as a mother-in-law so now the, the 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 roles have changed but my mom came over again and she says son could I tell you one more thing I said yeah mom you know I'm a young guy here I'm enjoying my wife enjoying our marriage enjoying our home enjoying our new family she says, you know, really, your, your wife doesn't know how to clean the house. And I, I felt with every launch of these deadly, wicked, sinister, satanic, demonized missiles that, that would diminish my home and my marriage and my wife. And again, Yvette had no idea that, that this, this sinister plot was going on. Um... We, we tend to 
classify women in two columns. Either you're going to be the woman God created, and we've heard a lot about it during this marriage conference, because at the end of the day, a marriage is made of the substance of a mature man and a virtuous woman. These are, these are the two ingredients that God intended to fulfill the call of marriage. And a lot of people are, are saying, what's wrong with my marriage? Well, you're not a wise man, or your wife is not pursuing the virtues, which means exceeding wisdom. That means a, a woman is not to play low ball. She's not to go in the gutter. She's not to play, you know, the, the ground where she's, she's to fly high. She's to observe. She's to be dignified. She's to be proper. This, this woman, the Bible says, is to be greatly praised for her value far surpasses the precious um, gems and stones. And, and she is a woman that has her husband's praise and her children's praise. So we, we know what that woman looks like. But the other woman, the, the one who decides she's not going to follow God's lead and she's going to have a mind of her own, we call her in an endearing Latino expression. You guys can repeat after me. Ready? Bru ha. Which means which. And the Bible says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. That means taking matters into your own hands and all the other expressions. So my mom came over, Christian woman, spirit-filled, born again. She said, son, could I tell you one last observation before I got to go? And I was like, okay, here it comes. She already threw the first missile Second missile, and here comes strike three. Ready? Your wife doesn't know how to raise children. So I had three major attacks on the same day within minutes of each other. And so my mom hates this story. Because we say that this is the work of the Grand Bruja, the great witch. So we need to be careful, and, and I needed to delineate for my mother... To help her along, I said, listen, you already had your tenure or your throne or your place of authority in your home, in your marriage, with your family. But in my house, another woman has taken that place, and she's my wife. And she rules the house. And she is the top-notch authority in my home. It's God. Then the Lord gives me my responsibility, like Nick explained. Then my wife sits upon the place of my authority, like Christ tells the church, that you will sit on my throne as I sit on my Father's throne. I'll give you a scepter. That's what he tells his bride. She rules the nations with a rod of iron. So there is some thinking out there that your wife is not to rule and reign, and you better... Allow your wife to take her proper place, dignified and awesome. And so I told my mom, you are not allowed to come back to my house to disparage my wife. Because it will be the end of our marriage, the end of our family, and I don't see how that edifies. So she was offended, she was hurt, she was sorrowful. But she took her rightful place, and she's been a blessing for the past 28 years. So these matters need to be addressed, and they're all out of order when we do not walk in the wisdom of God. So now, 28 years later, you've seen the champions my wife have raised. You come to my house, and she is the most incredible host. It's a hospital. She allowed this family to stay in our home for three months. And so there was the restoration and, and the renewal and the heart of God that we serve. Um, it doesn't matter who it is we need to serve. Uh, the, hospitality, the hospitality and hospitable environment is of a woman who knows her place to serve. And so along these lines, uh, it's made for proper standing 
at our church, when somebody gets married, we said this last night, we tell the groom to turn around to his mom and say, Bye, Mama Bear. It's been nice to know you. But it's not only the, the proper place for the man to do that with his outlaws, with his, his side of the responsibility to care for his wife so that she's not being disparaged. She's not being diminished. But we see also that God has made place for the woman to be able to walk in a manner of wisdom. And so we need to properly place our parents that we owe so much to, but we do not owe a measure that destroys our home. So we have to be careful with that. And just as a man could talk to his parents, um, the woman here in Psalm 45, she's raised up to be the provision for the next generation to survive. And if she's not proper in her understanding, because I've had the marital counseling and the woman says, well, you know something, I'm the only daughter of my parents, and I can't see the day that their priority is not my foremost obligation. Well, then don't get married. Because you were not called to attend to your parents as a priority. In Psalm 45, what I read here in verse 10, God says, listen, O daughter, Consider and incline your ear. Forget your own people and your father's house. There's a season and a time where you attend to the priorities of your parents. In fact, we say that a young man who is a good son makes an excellent husband. Those of you that are single, look for a young man that honors his parents. Look for a young man that's responsible to be obedient and to be within the guidelines and the instruction. You do not want to be with a rebel. In fact, we tell our men in our men's conference, a rebel will never be a man. A rebel will dwell in a dry land. He will be unfruitful. So if you want a science project for the rest of your life, go and marry yourself to one of these men who believe it's their plight in life to be a rebel without a cause. And so we see here also, if you're going to have an incredible wife, it's a woman who attended to her father's name. And she brought honor to that name by being obedient, by staying within the parameters of his instruction, her parents' instruction. Find uh, a woman who's a faithful daughter, obedient daughter, uh, one who honors her father's name. And then here it is where the season comes, the day of marriage, where she takes on, the Bible says like this, in order for the king to greatly desire your beauty, because now he is your Lord, and attend to him as the weight of responsibility. In that regard, it will be a new season. Verse 16, listen to these words. Instead of your fathers, now your interests will be the priority of your sons. In other words, the clarity of the instruction coming from your husband to the children should be your priority. And we see this is totally divided in many family circles, especially if you come from one of those families that require the daughter to attend to a father's priority and interest over her husband's. This prepares for a train wreck or for a husband to be latched on to his mother as a priority, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother. Painful process. 
So we need to garner and not forsake our parents uh, continues to be the plight of our interest. So while I had to delineate to my mom a line, a boundary line of protection and safety to my wife as a priority, but to this day, both of my parents know that I live for their honor and I live for their uh, care and attention. Um, the Lord has prospered us in these days. He's blessed us beyond measure. We, we attend to their financial needs. They've sacrificed so much. We're attentive to the need of any transportation with vehicles, um, any necessities of life. And, and so even this trip to a marriage conference to bring my in-laws, my mother-in-law, my father-in-law, was to refresh them, to honor them. To say, you know something, we'll do two days at a marriage conference and then let's take four days and drive down the Pacific coast so that we could refresh you and honor you and bless you. So that's who we are. Um, it took 20 years. How many think that 20 years is a long time? So I was married for 20 years when my father-in-law, he comes over, he's sitting here in the front row, I always introduce him at the men's conference as the man who gave me the greatest gift I enjoy outside of my salvation when he gave me permission to marry his daughter. So what an honor. But it wasn't without inspection and, and investigation. What would this man do with my daughter? To be able to care for her and love her and provide for her. And, and I always have that obligation because it's God's desire that I be the source of blessing to my wife and provision. It needs to come through me. I, I attest to God, if he says, he who provideth not for his own is worse than an unbeliever. So, God, why are you holding me to this responsibility? He who provideth not for his own. And I questioned God. I said, it's not fair that you should put me in the category of worse than an unbeliever because I'm not the conduit of provision to my house. And I asked God why, if the economy is upside down, if employment is unattainable, if we're not able to make ends meet, Lord, and how, how do you bring an indictment, a formal charge to a man who's not providing a provision in God? Listen to this word. Ready for this? Abundance. What's that mean? More than you need. What for? So that it's better to give than to receive. So God's perfect measure of provision for every man is abundance. So you not only have enough to care for your own, but now you're known as a generous man. You have to think upon others and to meet other people's necessity. So I said, Lord, it's not fair that you categorize man who doesn't provide as worse than an unbeliever. And he says, Joaquin, the only reason that a man would not be providing for his house is he's not listening to me. Because I'm Jehovah Jireh. I'm the God who provides. I said, I'm sorry. I didn't know that you had figured it out already. I thought I needed to help. But the excellence of a man who's standing obediently, I, I've told, listen, there's been about 10 men during the last two days, they've come up to me, and they said, Dr. Molina, thank you very much, but you know, my wife is not on the same page. And I'm saying, listen, she's only a reflection of your glory. And if you're not on the right page, she'll never get on the right page. In other words, quit worrying about her, and you get to where you need to be before him. And if you are where you need to be before God, then you shall see fruits of that reality. Then you'll be attractive. So in that regards, 
I always use in our counseling sessions of marriage, you guys know the force of two magnets. When one is turned in a manner which is improper, all that happens is there's a force that repels. And you could push it, you could maneuver it, you could try all, you could stand on those magnets, hoping they'll, they'll connect, and it will never happen without transformation. So you grab that magnet and you begin to turn it around and all of a sudden there is an attraction that now you cannot withstand. You can't pull them apart because it's so strong. And until a man gets right with God, then God begins to deal with him through his wife. And so I've said that when it wasn't good for man to be alone because he had no accountability. Now God gave him a mirror. And when he wakes up the man, he puts him to sleep, he pulls out a rib, and he makes a woman, he fashions a woman, and he introduces that woman to man. And when he wakes up and sees the father presenting the perfect help to this man, he utters the words, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. What's that mean? He's looking in the mirror. That's the only place upon the earth that you could say those words. If you're a man, you stand before a mirror, it has your reflection, you go, there I am. But the problem is man doesn't know that when there I am is reflecting his glory, when you see a frown on your wife's face, you know where it began. In the substance that was before her. When you see anything in your wife's life that is improper and untasteful, you know that God is dealing with you. Usually I get an amen, but that's fine. We're in Eugene. <laughs> no, listen. We know things are upside down. We're trying to move in the correct direction of the Lord. And so all these elements in their rightful place cause things to move in God's direction. There's a supernatural grace and anointing in our church. Then people stay within the greenhouse effect of the presence and purpose of God, and there's no divorce. It's just supernatural. It's not only a relational connect, it's a financial connect. And then let me tell you something. This is our session on sexual intimacy. But if you don't have the substance of those deep insights, which we call the spirit of man, if that stuff is not working, you have a cheap intimacy. It's not real. You're, you're, you, haven't, you even haven't come close to scratching the surface of what God created in the union of the marital bed. So here it is. God intended that this intimacy would be foundational on an aspect called purity. And if there's no purity in your life, because pornography has taken a great place in this, and, and, and how spiteful it is for a woman to know that her husband is dabbling, we call it sucking the gutter. How horrible it is for a woman to be um, competing with the life of fantasy, an unrealistic life. I, I, I rebuke men strong. That woman is fake, and if she was real, she wouldn't look at you, buddy. <laughs> so quit playing games. And so in that regard, it diminishes. One, one of the most affluent and influential and prosperous medical doctors in Argentina, he came into my office about 10 years ago, and he came with one of the men of our church, and he had warned him. He says, listen, Dr. Molina doesn't play around. Don't, don't come in his office even slightly not being on in reality. Like, the, the, you know, you, he, he's going to rebuke you hard if you, if you come in his office and you are flaunting your stupidity. So he came in, and he says, I'm sorry, Dr. Molina, in our country... We're known to be womanizers. And I said, well, in our, in our ministry, we call that a man who lacks 
testicular fortitude and is not a man. So while you call it womanizing, I call it you've been emasculated. They've stolen your manhood. And so he wasn't laughing anymore. But that's the truth of the matter. We cannot. We've been taught wrong. I was eight years old when the, when the little boy across the street in our neighborhood near Cocoa Beach, Florida, is growing up here and going to school, eight years old, and he crosses the street on a Saturday. And he says, Joaquin, I want to show you something I found under my dad's mattress. And he opened up this centerfold picture. It's the first time that I felt that a shotgun blast had, had exploded through my mind, corrupting the innocence of things I shouldn't have had my eyes upon at that age. So since eight years old, and let me tell you something, in this generation, it has gone farther into the crevices of our homes through these social media sites. Our kids would never, a, a, an eight-year-old, a, a five-year-old, an 11-year-old, has been saturated with so much pornography, you wouldn't even believe it. And these images that, that come to, to affect and to really intensely diminish the innocence that God intended for the sake of purity. And so I want to suggest if your intimate life with your wife is at issue, that you go back to purity. Either you, you, you think, well, we've lost it. No, 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 listen. We have marriages that come into our ministry. I, I, I recall one guy, and he testified here a couple of months ago. He says, I, I gave him the keys to my car. I said, listen, go in there and find a file. And he went to my car in the parking lot at church. He came back. He, was, he broke out in raunchy and all this uh, irritable skin. It was just red, and he was shaking, and he was nervous. I said, what's wrong with you, son? And he says, I just, I went into your car, and I was scared I was going to find something. Find something? What, what is something? He goes, no, if I would have found something, then you're not the same guy you talk on stage. I went to your personal, intimate life. And I said, no, see, son, you need to come to my house now. And you need to check every crevice and every private and secret place. And you're going to find Jesus in every corner of my existence. You're going to see God's holiness, his purity. Uh, my brother came back. Uh, this, this man, after he checked my car, he went home. And him and his wife, she says, what are you doing? They filled three glad bags, the big, large lawn landscaping bags, Three large landscaping bags with all the filth and all the craziness they had accumulated over a 10-year marriage. And they didn't want their kids to run into that stuff. And so we need some house cleaning in Eugene. We need to wash. And, and you don't spike your marriage intimacy by watching pornography. You're emasculating the man. You're, you're not to be a woman to imitate a prostitute. You're not to fashion yourself after these. These are, these are schemes of the devil to destroy the excellence of the marriage bed. And so it's so important that we would follow after God's design. And he tells us here, he's so descriptive as God talks to us about intimacy. You, you wouldn't fathom, fathom that God would get into this conversation there's nothing in the marriage bed that is perverse. There's nothing that is ungodly in, in the character and the design of God. My dad, a brain surgeon, a medical doctor, he would not talk the first word about sexuality to his son's life. Here he was, married for over 25 years, now I'm married, I'm having kids, and never one conversation with dad about such an important topic. So he kept mom like zero. There was no information coming my direction. So I had to go to the street. 
And so every vulgar expression, every crazy manifestation of how the movies are wrought, Hollywood is wrought, they, they can't make a marriage stick together, there's no sex or romance that causes them to flourish. Elizabeth Taylor had about 10 husbands. You see, all these movie stars, they, they have the best and the brightest of the expressions that you can have. But they're missing the, 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 the missing link is purity. And what does that mean? Because we don't know. We don't know, well, is this good? Is this auto good? How far do I go? How far do I come? Here it goes. Watch this. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3. God tells us this is the will of God, your sanctification. That's a big word. What does sanctification mean? This, this keeping apart, the not bringing to your marriage things twisted by those twisted. What's that mean? That you should abstain from sexual perversion. For things that are intimate, you know, in, in the regards of we have, it's so funny because we, we take our advice from the ungodly. And my Bible says, blessed is a man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. So how, why are we listening to perverted people on how to make our sex life work, our intimacy and so I've taught my children from a young age. Here they were, 12 and 13. Nick and Josh were the first one to be introduced to my class on the birds and the bees. And first in attendance, who do you think would be up there? My dad. He wanted to watch, how do you do this? Because I dropped the ball not being able to talk to my children, he says, because for him, sex was a dirty word. It's, it, it's, its expression would not be the plight of the conversation between a father and a son. And I'm sitting there thinking the opposite. I'm thinking, let me talk to Nick and Josh before the school does. Before their friends do. Before some idiot on the side of the road begins to mock them. So there I was, they were 12 and 13, I sat them down. And we went from A to Z, my father, God, hallelujah. And these two boys had their eyes wide open. They were hyperventilating. They were shaking. My dad is freaking out. And I said, boys, need I say anything more? And they say, dad, I think you told us too much. Just everything. Physiologically, biologically, everything that concerns anatomy, every expression on the street for things twisted, but all of it holy and pure. And so those young men were solid, never affected, never tainted by anything twisted in this world. Then Brandon was the next one, but he was a little bit too young. He was about 10. So it was a couple of years, and we waited till him to grow up, to start middle school. And he would always tell his mom, when is dad going to talk to me? When is dad going to talk to me? He says, don't worry, you'll have your turn. And so I did the same thing with Brandon and sketched everything out, put it on paper and showed him everything. What were their names, what were their proper names, what were their nicknames, what was a street name. So that he would understand. So he was well equipped. And he's the only one that had a response. At the end of that presentation, I said, do you want to know anything else, son? And he says, Dad, when can I get a girlfriend? <laughs> and I said, when you are, have the maturity enough to be able to steward the heart of a young woman, as long as you're immature, it's not the season. So we have put several parameters in our development of these young people first we tell them no finance no romance if you're not working and you haven't prepared yourself to take care of a woman and her needs and her priorities 
and adorning her, you're not ready to have a girlfriend. You're not ready to have your mom take you over to her house to pick you up to take you to the movies so you can pretend you have a relationship. That's an abomination. And it's endorsed by your friendly neighborhood bruja. A woman who is running ahead of time, ruining the life of their children. We had it happen in our church about 10 years ago. Pebbles' mom was a single mom. She met up with a young man, a single mom who's also 14. And they spent the whole summer being taken to and fro throughout the best beaches, restaurants, and hotels in Miami. And young kids falling in love in a summer's day with two moms that are putting all the right ingredients for a horrible end. As the young man went back to Georgia over the summer and Pebbles decided she would have a new boyfriend at the school at the first week of school. So that young man went back and hung himself. And so Pebbles came to the church. And she says, Dr. Molina, do you think this was my fault? And I said, absolutely. And if you continue to walk in that manner, he won't be the last one. But we need to be careful. We're not setting up our children for these consequences. That the Bible is replete with the resources of knowing the times and the seasons. And to walk in that wisdom. So no finance, no romance, no intimacy until you're married. Keep yourself pure because that shows me you're going to have the substance of the manhood to not run after another skirt as soon as you're married. Here a lot of young men go around telling their girlfriends, shh, don't tell your parents we're having sex. And they get married, and she goes to work, and her boss says, shh, don't tell your husband we're having sex. Well, who taught her? That young man who now is her husband. He's eating the fruit of what he's sown. And so God has given us the wisdom to walk in a different mindset and pursue a different priority. He says here, make sure that you're not aligning your relationship to that which is sexually twisted, so that each of you know how to possess your own vessel in sanctification and honor. What's that mean? How is it that I not disparage our relationship to treat my wife? And this is a lot of men say this. If you, we're not married, you won't have sex with me. I'll go with someone else. And then you, young woman, you say, be my guest. Because that guy's a loser. Don't let nobody come into the most sacred place that God decided. We, we said this at the men's conference. The womb is the place that God has ordained for godly seed. What's that mean? Somebody that honors the intimate realm of a woman's body. And if you have not chosen that manner of character you're going to have an issue with him going into every other womb. And so that is super important that, that you pay the price, that you stay the course, that you wait the seasons of God. We say like this, we say, allow the man that comes into your life not be drawn by cords of lust. If you showed your cleavage and that's what drew your man in your direction, then another pair is going to lead him away. He's going to be drawn by lust because you drew him by lust. And so a lot of women say, I don't understand why he keeps on. Well, you were the first one. One of the men that we came to know was a customs agent in Miami and he went through somebody's luggage and he made fun of her panties, and she ended up marrying the guy. And then some years later, 10 years later, two children later, guess what he was doing? He was rummaging through somebody else's luggage. 
And she's like, Pastor, how did this happen? I go, I never know. It's, it's incredible. But if your foundations to the relationship is to be drawn by lust, kill that thing. Kill that thing all out. I tell men in our church that come for the first time, don't have sex for a full year. There's dead silence in here. Why? Because that's not to be the centerpiece of the relationship. Start building another area of your companion. Because the day will come where that will not sustain the relationship anyways. Maybe we get some amen. It has to be something greater in substance. And what has been cultivated in my life with my wife, yeah, it's glorious. But the substance is the intimacy in spirit. Our passion to do the will of God is greater than our passion in the heat of the night. There's a connection in the spirit. What, what happens there? I'm not attracted to any other women. Because I'm not, I'm, my measure is not physical. It's not going to draw me away from what we've cultivated for 28 years. So man is triune. God created him. He says, let us make man. And then the Bible says he formed him from the dust and then he blew into his nostrils and he became a living soul. So there you have it. He made him in the spirit. He, he prepared a body in the dust and he blew into his nostrils a living soul. He became body, soul, and spirit. So the years that we are courting, because the difference between courting and dating is supervision. Accountability. And so we, we have that in our measure um, with respect to the marriages that come together. We don't let a woman give herself away. Who gives this bride away? She gave herself away. She never talked to her dad. Her dad didn't have an opinion. He didn't have a weight of counsel. He had nothing to do with who she chose. The biblical model I've been reading to my daughter since she's six is when Abraham's servant comes over and finds her, Rebecca, and says, I want a wife for my son Isaac, for my master's son, Isaac. And she says, you're going to have to talk to my father and my brothers first. There has to be a first line of defense. You don't give yourself away. If you give yourself away, then he has to answer to no one to give you back. And so you make him go through catching a lizard or two. <laughs> showing his courage, showing his finances, showing his faithfulness. We do not let men get married in our church unless they are faithful tithers. Because if they're not faithfully tithing in the most important relationship of their life, it's because they're still teething. They're not fit to have a wife and to steward a family and finances. So a lot of guys will come and say, I'm ready, Pastor. I'm ready as I've ever been. I said, let me see how much money you made. 80000 Okay, let me see that $8,000 went into the Lord's coffers. Oh, no, because I, I wanted to buy a new car. Oh, no, because I have a hobby. It's expensive, Pastor. You don't understand. So you're not fit to take on care of a wife. Because the Bible says if you tithe, God will rebuke the devourer and he will pour into your coffers abundance. And you'll lack no need. So if you're not taking care of the primary areas of your intimacy, and I don't check these things. I consider in my church when, when you know, these guys, that I ask them if they tithe, but, but a lot of people want to know, well, Pastor, do you know who are the big givers and the small givers? I don't do that. Because to me, that area is so intimate. It would be the same as asking you how often you have sex with your wife. If I, if, if I have to meddle into the intimate affairs of how you give God, there, there's something wrong if you're not having a, a mutual expression of, of gratitude and love. And, and in that area of your life, I'm not going to inspect that. But if you're not giving God his portion, that shows me you're not intimate with God. 
And so whether I inspect it or not, so we go to this scenario. I, I do this often in my law firm as people were coming for divorces. I was trying to explain to men what the issue was. I said, sir, here I'm going to give you a blank sheet of paper. And in this blank sheet of paper, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna fill it out. Here's a pen. You're going to fill it out. Give me a column of all the things you don't like about your wife. And so they, the, at first at the top, this is, she doesn't want to have intimacy. And then she doesn't honor me. She disrespects me. She, so, so the list goes on. There, there could be 100 things. I only asked for 10 because I, I don't want to belabor the point. <laughs> you can write 100 things, but just 10. And then, you know what I do? I, I come over here, and I grab a paper. And I, I, I'm, I said, sir, just like you wrote down the things that you don't like about your wife, I, I'm going to write you here a column of things that God doesn't like about you. And so I'll put at the top. What do I put at the top? Doesn't want to have intimacy. The man doesn't want to have intimacy. He dishonors God. He disrespects. He doesn't keep within the parameters. And, and so you know what? I grab his paper. I turn my paper around. And they both match perfectly. That a wife's reflection with her husband is the same reflection that the man has in his relationship with God. And so until you heal in the spirit realm, until you cultivate in the spirit realm, you're not prepared to enjoy what God wants you to enjoy, and you would never have tasted. So we, we have this comparison. There's poor people in South America. They live around the trash heaps, and they go in there every day for food. And the only apples they've ever eaten were rotten apples, worm-filled rotten apples. But they're the only ones that are available and the only ones that nourish the family. And so here we are in Christ. We have befuddled the sexual relationship to such a degree that we're sucking the sewer. We've never enjoyed what God created from day one. And then you got all these perverted people talking into this issue. But if you do it God's way, the joy, the peace, the, the glory reflected on the countenance of women and men that have found a secret. That being able to cultivate the recipes of intimacy. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship. If you're lying to your wife, if you're cheating, this, this doctor from Argentina, prominent womanizer, little man, no masculine, no, he was emasculated. He says, you know, so I have a problem. I, I have no sexual appetite for my wife. I said, well, let's discuss this a little bit. I know that we just met, but I want you to go back to Argentina understanding there's no enigma. If you're having sex on Monday with your receptionist, on Tuesday with your nurse, on Wednesday with your patient, on Friday with your high school sweetheart, on Friday watching pornography, it's apparent to me you have no appetite in this realm. You have despised the provision of God. So when you begin to disparage the intimacy God intended, and you're walking in an expression that has nothing to do with his design, no wonder you don't sit at a banquet table. If we walk in the light, if we're transparent, if we're true, if we're intimate in the spiritual realm, then we have fellowship. We're connected with one another. We are able to enjoy what God created. So, so the travesty of men gone wild in their thoughts and the expressions of what they want to do and, and delight in that are totally, totally coming from a twisted dark world that will never have what God intended. Here it is that you should abstain from sexual morality. What's this mean? 1 John 4, 4. Each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Listen, the contrast. Sanctification and honor, the contrast is not in the passion of lust. 
These, these intimate expressions of closeness and sexuality with your wife is not letting your lust move in the direction you, you'll be freaking out what plate you'll be eating afterwards after this monster you created is unsatisfied. The Bible says that lust is never satisfied. And so soon you'll see yourself meandering into another direction that totally embarrasses you. A relationship of adultery. Relationship of an affair. I, I tell the men in our men's conferences, how many times do you think Jesus Christ was unfaithful to his bride? The answer is none. Why? He's a perfect man. He's not walking in to fulfill the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. He has diminished himself to, to walk in the spirit so he not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so here it is. It says, each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Verse 5, not in the passions of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. That cannot be our pattern for us to walk in these, these, you know, I'm embarrassed to say that this Fifty Shades of Grey novel has taken off in this generation. And it hasn't been the men, it's been the women. Because if that's what you're going to feed your wife, then when she is lost in unrelentless, uh, the, the word is without restraint, you don't want your wife to walk in the direction of lust. If you sow that, you will reap that, sir. And you will be put to shame every time. The Bible says this is how the Gentiles walk. They have no restraint. They do not know God. So no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter. And, and this is the reason, and, and I find it particular, because the Lord avenges every single one of these scenarios. So when we talk about these matters in, in our church, it's not because people are scared of Dr. Molina. It's not because they're scared of what the church might think about them. God addresses these matters. It's in his sovereign perspective to judge those that walk in such a manner. So here it is. It continues to specify. God will avenge such. As we also forewarned you and testified. Verse 7. For God did not call us to uncleanness. But he purposed us into holiness. So these guys want to interrupt my session. That's fine. Here we go. We'll get back to them. I, I, I want to challenge you to begin to recreate. I, I don't think you could last a whole year without intimacy. Um, the Bible says that the devil takes advantage of those who distance themselves for too long. It says it in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Make sure that when you guys are not attending to one another's needs... That the devil not come in and ransack your marriage. I, I, I feel that, that this woman in Proverbs 5, 6, and 7, if you read all her attention to capture the soul of the gullible, and you, you go at it and you find out all the uh, attributes of this wayward woman who's capturing the soul of the gullible. It, it, it talks about how she addresses her pillows, her sheets, her bedspread. It says that she puts perfume, that she prepares a meal, that she's, she's dressed in a manner. And we always say that sometimes our inability to groom causes there to be a falling out. So this also has to be a, one of our attentions to make sure, like the, the man who... His wife got saved. She started going to church. She heard one of my messages. And when her husband got home that night, he knocked on the door. He was coming in. And when she opened the door, she had taken a shower. 
She had perfume on, something was smelling from the kitchen, and he said, oh, sorry, neighbor, I got the wrong house. It was his wife. But he, she, was, she was not, he didn't recognize her because it wasn't how she would re- welcome him in times past. So here it is, we must attend to these matters. And it says to do so in such a way that you're not competing against God. He says, verse 7, God did not appoint us to uncleanness, but to holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject a message today by man, but God, who's given us his Holy Spirit, that we might be able to bring that level of expression to our home. That we might be able to bring that expression to our home. That we might champion this this life. um, Keeping tabs on the need of your wife with respect to... Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Nothing is above your purview in these matters. We pray for this situation that you intervene. And we rebuke Satan. We rebuke the work of the enemy who comes to kill, steal, and destroy, Lord. We need you, Lord. We want you. And that you manifest your presence and your power. That you be glorified, Lord. That you bring peace and healing and restoration. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Here we go. Amen. When we're traversing the oceans of life in this particular area of sexuality, let's not look at the wind and the waves. Let's make sure that we have all the coordinates and that we're proceeding in a manner that honors the heart of God so that we have a harvest down the road and the fruit of what we're talking about this year. So the accumulation of all that has transpired during our marriages and the wrong ways we did things and trying to, I was telling a man that many men tried to get their wives drunk in order to enjoy sexuality and deliver themselves from the frigidness of a cold relationship. No, you don't want to do it that way. You want to get right in spirit. You want to begin to cultivate that which God wanted from the beginning. And God's able to cause these things to flourish. When I met the Medieto family that testified earlier this morning, and they talked to me about their story of so much diminished time and relationship and infidelity, they could never think of going back to a relationship. The same thing with George Carrigal in our church, being married the first three years and seeing his wife become a spiteful, bitter, resentful young wife. He says, Pastor, the only one I, I could have intimacy with was call girls. My relationship with Lily was so distraught with so much anger, so much unforgiveness, so much cluttered that we couldn't enjoy the marriage bed. And so start walking and working in that direction. I'm always blown away by men who write these type of letters. I want to read you a letter that was written by a man who was married for 11 years. And they had struggled in every expression to try to ground their marriage and make it work. And this bright genius decided to write this letter 10 years into the marriage. And he wrote these, this letter to his wife. He says, the conditions by which I will cause us to stay married or not depends on your ability to make sure that my clothes and my laundry are kept in good order that I receive three meals a day regularly taken to my room, that my bedroom and my study area are kept neat, especially my desk, which would be for my use solely, for my use alone. You will renounce all personal relationships in regards to friendship with me as so far as they are not completely necessary for social reasons. Specifically, you will forego sitting near me at home, going out with me as I travel. You will obey the following points in your relationship with me. You will not expect any intimacy from me, nor will you reproach me in any way. You will stop talking to me if I request it, and you will leave my bedroom or study immediately upon and without protest when I request it. And you will undertake not to belittle me in front of the children, either through words or through your behavior. Well, you would know that that marriage did not last. And the author of that marriage was Albert Einstein. And so these great minds in the world that have no clue on how to cultivate a relationship is what we need. Let's watch this last video, and it culminates what we started this morning. Pick up my shoes. Honey, I'm home. Honey, you're home. Hey. Oh, let me no, get those shoes don't for you. Worry Turn up the volume, please. please. Welcome How's home. How was your day? It was good. good. Man, what that smell? It smells so good. Your favorite, spaghetti and meatballs. Yes. Where are the kids? I'm not sure. Kids, dad's home. Hey, bud. How's it going? Hey, it's all good. Good. Hey, Dad. Hi, Zoe. Guess what? What? I got an A on Mr. McCain's history class. What? That's amazing. That's incredible. Huge I improvement. I couldn't have been without you. Thank you so much for helping me study last night. Those YouTube videos really helped. They sure did. Oh, man, I, 
found these super nice Nikes, but don't worry about it. I've been saving all my money so I can pay for them. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about it. Pro Vision. No way. Oh my gosh, it's so Thanks, cool. Dad. That's right. Cool. Hey, babe, how's the AC holding up? Um, so the AC is still kind of leaky, but mm. I have the buckets. So I'm keeping an eye on it. I think we should be okay. Okay. Well, I called the AC guy. He said he'll come by sometime this week and he'll be able to check it out. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That'll work out great. Um, this morning I started my car and there was like some funky noises. Maybe when you get a chance, you can check it mm. out and see what's kind of going on. Okay. Well, how about this? Tomorrow morning on the way to work, I'll just take your car and I can drop it off at the mechanic then. Okay. That works out perfect. All right. Yeah. And by the way, I know I just gave him some money and the FPL bill is coming due, but I know our situation. God is faithful and I'm sure he's going to provide. I know he will, I have no doubt. All right, I'm gonna go shower. All righty. Hey there, handsome. Have you been working out? Kids, bedtime. I think she said, hey, hot pants, or something like that. Um, the magnets turned around. The attraction begins to take place. And God begins to give you an enjoyable expression of that which you've cultivated in the spirit, that which becomes an intimate reality and friendship. To cultivate that friendship, to cherish that friendship, to not betray it. And then it cultivates in the marriage bed being a place of harvest and enjoyable. I want to tell you that the world comes into our circles with much heavier issues and consequences of having lived so long without the Lord. We do not dare say that we are sufficient for these things and we're just going to do what the Bible says and we're going to there's all manner of things that are causing us not to attain to the excellence of these issues. So prayer is a great part of that. Fellowship is a great part of that. About 10 years ago, I was invited to go to the police department in Miami. And I was invited by the chaplain who was gathering with about a squad of police officers in an early morning prayer breakfast. And he said, Dr. Molina, would you come and speak to these police officers. So I showed up that morning, around seven o'clock in the morning, and we gathered for prayer, and then he gave me an opportunity to speak. And by the end of that half hour, 45 minutes session at that prayer breakfast, a woman came near to me, and she says, I'm having issues at home with my husband. She wasn't a police officer, but she was best friends to the corporal, to the mayor the major at that police department, one of the highest offices right before chief of police. And she had been there at the prayer service and she came up to me and she says, but me and my husband are having issues. I wish he would have been here this morning and would have heard everything you said. And so I gave her the address to our church. I said, why don't you bring your husband out to church? And she's a phenomenal woman. She's a woman who strived to champion the cause of her marriage for so long. She had married a man who did not believe God, who did not have a relationship with God, who did not govern his life and his understanding by godly instruction. So she grabbed the address and she came to our church. I noticed her coming for four weeks straight every Sunday, but she wouldn't bring her husband. She would come alone and she would listen. She was scoping out the land. She was being a spy. As her husband told her these words, I'm only going to allow you to take me to church one last time. So you better make it a good shot because I don't intend to ever go back to church. And if that day God doesn't do a miracle, we're done. We're going to file for divorce. 
And so she came four times, and I guess she liked what she heard, and she was attracted to the message and to the atmosphere and the climate of her church in Miami. So now it's Father's Day, and she invites her husband to come, and that's the wrong day to show up at our church. Because the missiles are flying, and I only get one shot because I know these guys want to come one day a year to impress their family and community, and they're going to be pious for a day. But now I have to lamb blast all hell out of them <laughs> in 45-minute opportunity. So as the missiles began to fly that day, I noticed that she began to crouch down on her chair, and her husband was looking at her and going like this. You picked the wrong day, the wrong time, the wrong church, and the wrong pastor. I'm going to allow him to tell the rest of the story because he's here with us today. This one's about to die. This is Carlos Leon and his amazing, beautiful wife, America. Good afternoon, church. First of all, I want to thank um, Dave and Bobby for just uh, putting this together. Uh, it's a beautiful venue, and real quickly, we saw each other in in Colorado with Pastor, because I travel with Pastor everywhere, and um, and he came up to us afterwards, and the first thing he said, listen, I love what you guys said, so I want to get together. How can, can you guys come to here to Eugene? And we left him. We were like, yeah, we'll probably never go to Eugene, but he called, and the next four months ago, we came here for a men's conference, and now here we are in a marriage conference, trying to change the world. Right? With Miami and Eugene. So imagine that. So thank you very much uh, for everything that you've done because, you know, you're serious. You're serious about this, and we're serious about what we do here. But at the end of the day, I was an atheist. I didn't believe at all. And uh, I worked for UPS. I was UPS for 35 years. And America... Uh, it was 20, we've been married 23 years. We got uh, three kids and we got four grandkids. So our oldest is 43 years old. So uh, when all this was going on, America already had served the divorce papers on me. And we had them on the table and I didn't want to sign them. I was like, no, I'm not going to sign them. No, one of the saddest things that I saw for me was when she left the house and she was gone and we had two apartments, one for my mother and one for my mother-in-law, right in the same place. But I realized uh, she would drive to go see her mother and I would go drive to see my mom. But she, at one point, she drove her car and I was already parked there, and she saw me coming. She saw the car parked there, and I was with my mom. And, but there's hedges, and you can't see that I was there. But I could see her. And I realized as she was stepping out, I can see her face over the hedges, and she's looking over to see if she sees me at my mom's house. And I see her. And I see her face, and I realized that I had failed as a man not protecting my wife. Because her sadness in her face was just one of the hardest things I ever seen in my life. I had failed to be a husband, a provider for my kids, for her. And I knew then that I needed a change. I knew that I wasn't going to divorce her. I knew that I wasn't going to give her that. But I just didn't know how. I didn't know how I was going to change that. 
And she tells me, I said, look, you know what? Let's go have coffee. We went to have coffee, and we had coffee together. And I said, listen, I don't know what we're going to do, but we're not, we're not going to fall apart. We got to figure out a way to get back. I had destroyed the marriage. I, was dis- I destroyed it. Every vow that you can think of, I-, I went against that, and I destroyed her and destroyed her. But I, I wasn't going to give up, and she wasn't going to give up. So we decided, and she says, listen, I, I met this pastor. Uh, I want you to go see him. Believe me, being an atheist is not, I kept going to church just for her. It's not something that was in my heart. I didn't feel, I didn't feel it. And I said, I'll go. But we had tried and kept trying and kept trying. And I finally told America, if we don't make it this time and this pastor doesn't work, I'm out of here. I got to go. And you got to go because we're going in different, different directions. And it was on Father's Day, and I walked into his church, and I, you know, I hid on the side, obviously. Um, it's hard to hide when you're 6'5", but, you know, it's, <laughs> they saw me. And his message on Father's Day was the hardest message anybody had talked to me because I'm an orphan. And nobody ever told me what I needed to do. Every decision I made was always my decision. Nobody else's decision. Nobody could tell me yes. Nobody could tell me no. I made that decision. But he, his message was so penetrating. It penetrated my heart so hard because somebody finally was trying to tell me what I needed to do. Finally, somebody said, hey, you're doing it wrong. So on the way out, she was, she was petrified. She, she just said, she looked at me and she looked at him. She heard the message. She goes, we're done. We're out of here. You know, she knew she was in trouble. And on the way out, he looks at me and he goes, hey, what did you think? And I said, you know what, pastor? At that time, he was a pastor. You're not for everybody. But you're for me. I remember back on Sunday. And I've been at that church for 10 years. I traveled the world with him. I retired from UPS five years early to go travel with him. And when every time I travel is to change the world. And he has transformed me and that God has transformed through him my life. And the relationship that we have now it's only a miracle through God. I honestly can tell you that. Because he has totally transformed me. And I would like for her to, that situation where she was, you know, to explain some of that of what she was going through. I will do my best. First, we are a miracle. And we are the grace of God before you. Because... Our marriage was over. Um, We tried for two years. It wasn't a decision that we came to overnight. We were struggling and we were trying. Uh, We went to different places, different churches. My friend Nancy, the major, she was my spiritual sister. We'd known each other for almost 20 years. And so I went to her because I really didn't believe that I had friends that I could really open my life to and tell them what I was going through. This is not our first marriage. So I was married before, and so was Carlos. And 13 years of my life before him was in ministry. So we did home church. uh, We did all kinds of outreach. And I had already given my life to Christ since I was 18. So... The nine years that I spent alone, I struggled as a mom. My son was in jail. He was 16 years old because his father also walked out on him when he was 11. And then I had a eight-year-old daughter. And by this time, she was 14, and she was in the street. Because at the end of the day, even though I was alone, I tried to hold on to my principles and my belief and God and Jesus. So when I met Carlos, I told him, look, 
I have walked away from my true love, which was the Lord. And I wanted him to know that about me. I told him about my son, my daughter, my situation, all my circumstances, thinking that I would scare him away. Because at that time, I really didn't want a relationship again. I, I didn't. I, I knew that I needed to be alone with the Lord for a while. But he was so good and so nice and so kind, and he was a gentleman. And I don't know about you ladies, but if you've been out in the world for a while without a man standing for you, you know that it's not easy. And you get lonely, and you feel empty, and you feel lost, and you want to be loved. So you make a lot of stupid choices, which I did. But when he came along, it was like, wow, okay. Yeah, he's not a God-fearing person. He, he says he's an atheist, but, you know, he knew God was real. Because God had saved his life a couple times before. But he accepted my situation. He accepted my children. And we began to date. And it was a love story. I mean, it, it, it was... It still is. It's a better one now, but at that time, it was a love story. But then it turned into a train wreck, and then it became tragic. And while we battled and we talked, the Lord started talking to me. And I read every kind of book you can imagine. I, I went to church without him because in the beginning, he did not want to go. And finally, he said, okay, I'll go to church. So after a few months of that, I said, look, Carlos, you're not, you're not doing this for the Lord, and you're not doing it for yourself. This is what you're doing to try to hold on to me. And the Lord's not going to honor that. He's not going to bless you, and he's not going to hear your prayer. So we might as well just, you know, call it a day. So I did go. I went, and I filed for the divorce, but he wasn't, he wasn't having it. Thank God. Thank God at least that much. But we did separate, and I did move out of our house. And I did meet the pastor at that police station, but I met him, but I didn't go see him for another year. It was a whole year of thinking because I knew he would not tolerate anything that was going to come from him because no one's ever spoken to him like that before. Now, my husband charged three to 400 men in his job. And he was used to people looking up to him and him telling people what to do. So for him to allow another man to come and speak to his life, I knew it was, it was like mission impossible because I heard what pastor said and it moved me. He scared me, okay? He scared me, and I, but, but I sat there like, I know some of you women are sitting and saying, why doesn't someone talk to my husband like that? Why doesn't someone in church have the courage, the audacity, the intestinal fortitude, if you will, to crack my husband's head wide open and say, listen, you're a bum. You don't honor the gift that God has given you. And I used to tell him, I used to tell him, I said, listen, you, you're never going to have another woman in your life like me. I did. Because I knew what God thought I was. I knew my position in Christ. I know that he loved me. He died for me. Christ gave his life for me and for my kids. So I had to get to that point in my life that I said, America, are you going to really just continue to put up with less and not follow what God really has? So we had to make a decision. And I told him, I said, look, you come to this church, at, but I did warn him. I said, you're not going to like it. <laughs> and you're going to get offended and you're going to get insulted and he's going to challenge your manhood like no one has ever, ever done. I told him, right? I did. I warned you. <laughs> and, and our pastor did not disappoint. <laughs> Thank
Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> but we did sit down and talk, and I said, okay, so here it is. Um, I love you. I always have and I always will. But I cannot and I will not continue to walk this life with you unless you genuinely, honestly, truly want to give your life to the Lord. And I said, look, maybe it's not going to be now. Maybe it's not going to be with me. But if it is going to be with me, then we have to fix this and make this right. And God is good. We know that in that time that I was alone in my own apartment, I came to know God in a way that I never had before. Because you know what? Only he heard the prayers that nobody's ever heard before. And he saw my tears. Absolutely. But he healed me. He gave me purpose. He gave me courage. And I just knew that if he could really make up his mind to do this thing, that God was going to have a plan for us. And that was 10 years ago, and here we are in front of you. So I want to tell you ladies that I've had the opportunity to talk to out there. Don't stop. Don't quit. Because you're a princess to your father in heaven. Okay? And he's going to give you what you deserve. And then there was another lady, beautiful lady, that opened her heart to me as well. And I want to say this to you. Because I walked away from you because I had to run in here. You don't lay down your life for any man because your God gave his son, Jesus Christ, and he died on that cross for you. So you can't lay down your life for anybody else because he already paid that price. Okay? So here we are. We're happy. We're blessed. We're encouraged. And... Um, it's an honor and a joy for us to be here before you today. Our church has been praying for this time for all of your marriages, for all of your children, your families, your grandchildren. And I'm just overwhelmed with the goodness of God. So thank you so much for welcoming us into your home. We love you. Um, real quick. It's hard opening up and it's hard giving a testimony and putting your life out there in front of others, especially when you were as private, and I was a very private person, and we were. But we put it out here, so if you're going, and you're sitting there and going through the same things that we're going through, you can understand that there's hope, change can happen, and if you're committed and you walk with the Lord, it will come through and it will change your whole complete life. Thank you very much and for the time that we had. And God yeah, bless hallelujah. you all. Thank you, sir. Awesome. I don't need... Oh, there we are. Okay. I, I'm blown away by the mercies of God. I have the responsibility every time we have anything to speak in any direction, um, we owe it to the world to speak as if God were speaking into every situation. We cannot bring human mindset, human emotion, and sentiment. So my desire is when these couples come, when you have access to a marriage relationship, tell them what God would tell them. Don't, do not cater carnal sentiment because you're only going to reap carnal fruit. And it was a timely day and a timely moment that Carlos would hear the voice of the Father. 
and that he would respond. There was so much resentment. He tells the story of his father leaving his life when he was six years old. And so I never saw the model of a husband, never saw the model of a father, never saw what family would look like. And so it's so difficult for these men to come back home. But when they do, they're incredible sons. They're incredible husbands. They're incredible dads. And now he is leaving a legacy to his grandchildren. They're seeing a 60-year-old man humble himself and walk meekly before his maker. And that's the greatest expression and example we owe it to our families. That they might witness the way you treat your wife because that's the same way they will treat their wives. I have no doubt that Yvette's posture in our relationship because she has the same capacity as any other woman to walk in any other expression, and she chose to walk in the fear of the Lord. And the Bible says she would be greatly praised. And every country we go through, I tell you that I get off the airplane, and the first thing they want to know is, how is Yvette doing? Because they know that she is the strength behind the expression of God's glory. And so we each are called to do the same thing throughout the world. We've translated this book into seven languages. We go to Poland, we go to Germany, we go to Switzerland, we go to India, we go to South Africa, and the issue's always the same. Where are the men that walk in the fear of God to honor their wives, to honor the marriage relationship, to fulfill the call of God? You see in the Bible that God begins history with a marriage relationship in Adam and Eve and he culminates there in Revelations 19 verse 6 with the celebration of a marriage of his son it's a central theme throughout the Bible the relationship that is so awesome that Paul says it's a mystery of Christ in the church that everything we do we do as unto the Lord and in that regards it's been a joy to be for, uh, with you it's been a joy to be part of you. The testimonies are through the roof. I, I'm so excited for the men who came out to the men's conferences. They continue to express the joys of taking the challenge of manhood and going back to their wives and to their children to be an expression of Christ. Not religiously, but authentically. And in the same manner now, we have the women who have come out. I don't know what you were expecting, but I think that God far surpassed any expectation we had of the challenge he's called you to higher ground. That you can come into the challenge of saying, I wonder what glory God decides to reveal. As I read Proverbs 3.35, he says, the wise shall inherit glory, but the fools shall inherit shame. We've come from our forefathers who did it all wrong. If, if I tell you, if I were to share with you what my father, he had gotten saved, his marriage with my mom got restored, he had begun to walk in the ways of the Lord, it was glorious, it was powerful, that's my inspiration. To see what God did with my parents and their healing, restoration, their separation, their divorce. All these things culminate on my passion to make sure no person suffers the demise and the destruction of marriage. And so that's our passion. Watch this. As I was getting married on the day of our wedding, my dad approaches me and he's going to give me fatherly advice. The best fatherly advice he can in the flesh. And he says, son... Don't worry, women are like cars. If you don't like one, you just take off with another. And so I said, thanks, Dad. You have no clue. You don't have the counsel of God. You don't understand the ways of wisdom. So it's necessary for us to tap into these things. It's necessary for us to, I guess, ferret them out. The Bible says, as treasure 
that is lodged deep within the sacred scriptures. I found this passage here in Ezekiel 16. It blows my mind because Christ is the perfect example in all his ways. You don't have to look around horizontally. Lift up your eyes to the height of the, the, the greatest measure of husbandry is Christ. And see him lay down his life for his wife. He says, greater love has no man than the one who's willing to lay down their life for a friend. And so here in the book of Ezekiel 16, 1, he says, when I passed you, I passed by you again, I looked upon you indeed, your time was the time of love. Everything was right at the day you looked upon your spouse, the day she looked upon you, and God graciously gave you the the gift of attraction so that you gravitated towards one another. And in this ingredient of love, he says, I spread my wings over you and covered your nakedness. That means the function of a husband is not to expose the nakedness of your wife. And we make fun of our wives in every expression that we have an opportunity due to our complexes. You're too short, you're too tall, you're too fat, you got big feet, you got big toes, you got big ears. We begin to mock the one we're supposed to cover. And, and, and make an oath today after this marriage, you will never be the source of embarrassment or shame towards your spouse. That that is not what God intended for your function to be, but that you would cover her nakedness with your covering, yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into the covenant. This, this a lot of people say, well, we don't need a paper. We don't need to go to the courthouse. We don't need to make this official. Listen, dignify your relationship by making her your lawfully wedded wife. Go to the courthouse right after this marriage conference and get married. Dignify the power of the blessing upon that relationship by being accountable to the laws of this state. He says, I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you, and you became mine, says the Lord God. Verse 9, he says, I washed you with water. Yes, I thoroughly washed off every stain. I anointed you with oil. The anointed oil is know your wife's favorite perfume. You should know that. Not your neighbor, not her parents, not her sister. You should become acquainted with the scent that is, is, is onerous of the fact that she's yours. And find out. I know I, I once asked a man, what's your, fa- your wife's favorite perfume? He says, oh no, she breaks out in a rash when she gets perfume on her. And it was his excuse not to get her perfume not to know the name and so he says there not only did I anoint you with oil I clothed you with embroidered clothes I I gave you covering I took you to the mall I made sure that you were adorned with the best according to what God has provided I spent more money adorning my wife than I did on my old 1965 Mustang who's out in the backyard. Men spend way more in their hobbies than they do adorning their wives. Well, start moving in the direction of Christ's example and clothe her, the Bible says, and gave her sandals. See, this guy knew that women love shoes. (laughs) I clothed you with fine linen. I covered you with the priciest silk. I adorned you with ornaments and put jewelry as bracelets to your wrist. I put a chain around your neck. As I was early married to Yvette in the early years, every expression of my gifting to her, when we we still, we walk into places and then we start buying stuff and the people swear that she's my lover. I've never seen a man just really go out on behalf of a woman. Who is this woman? I go, she's the wife of my second child, and my first, and my third, and my fourth. Because people have not seen how bizarre is it that a man would pour out 
the wealth and the significance of his earnings not on his mother, but on his wife. And that he adorned her, and it says there, he, he clothed her with fine linen, covered her, put gold, earrings, beautiful crown on her head. You were adorned with gold and silver, and your clothing was with fine linen, silk, and embroidered cloth. You ate at the best restaurants. You know, Taco Bell does well. But make sure your wife sits down at a banquet table, all a reflection of how God is going to treat you. As you lavishly pour out the expressions of love in tangible, manifested realities. Some guy says, I don't like to buy my wife flowers because they wither. You're a knucklehead. <laughs> That's why you're supposed to buy her flowers every week. Begin to adorn her. Begin to, to use your manhood and your strength, not to spend seven, eight hours at the gym, but to, to further the cause of her dreams. God has put it in the bride to tell the love story of Christ and the church, and, and the wife is, wants to move away from the 50 shades of gray to make her love story the greatest love story ever told. But it requires a man that walks in this expression. I gave you fine pastry, honey, oil. You were exceedingly beautiful and you succeeded to royalty till your fame went out amongst the nations and your beauty. It was perfect through splendor which I have bestowed upon you. You're not to look upon another woman. You're to adorn the one God gave you. And with this, I invite our prayer team to come up to the front of the room here. And I think I have spoken far too much. I love you guys. You are in our hearts. Thank you for Dave Hyland and Bobby. Thank you for caring about the marriages here in Eugene. I promise you this will be a different city. If you take to heart what God takes to heart, and you see all throughout scripture, his intention is that there would be a glorious bride dressed in the most radiant of garments. And I've seen this happen. And I said this at our men's conference. I'll say it now. I said it last night. The largest expressions of fortunes that have been lost have been husbands who have not listened to their wives. And I want to suggest that Christ will adorn you to the measure and to the extent that you intend to be faithful and bless that woman and love her like she's never been loved before. Adorn her. Give her treats. Give her, give her the expressions of your most incredible treasures lavished upon her that, that cry out to the ends of the earth where your treasure is, there your heart is also. In my law practice, as people came after 25 years of marriage and asking for divorces, I said, I have the antidote to your divorce. And they said, what is it? I said, give everything you own to your wife. And they're like, are you crazy? I said, no. Because where your treasure is there, your heart is also. You'll take care of that woman for the rest of your life because she has everything you own. <laughs> That's the secret sauce. Give your wife everything. Bestow her with the confidence that she's the one. And have that expression follow where you see the glory of God honor you as you honor him. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Lance. Appreciate it. Oh, sorry about that. Get up there making an ass. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. You know, when you get to the end of these kind of conferences, it's like, well, what do we do now? The Bible says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Thank you, friend. <laughs> Thank you, friend. Oh, Lord. You know, I, <clears throat> a couple days ago, I've been working on a project at my house, right? Got five acres. How many here, if you have any acreage, you have blackberries? 
They're your enemy, right? We've been there for 22 years. I've always wanted to attack these. And then I had the greatest thing happen this winter, the snow. Beat them down, right? <clears throat> had a guy come out, a friend of mine, hired him. We'd whacked it. And then I found out from Dave Highland, he's got to walk behind Brush Hog. I am going somewhere with this. As I went through, here's what I noticed. It beat it down, and it got to a place of, oh, now, this is, this is something that can, can actually be changed. Right? And then the brush hog came in. You know what I found? Rocks and limbs and all kinds of stuff. See, the Molina and their team, they, they were like a brush hog. They came in here and just mowed. Whoa. You know what it exposed in our own lives, my life, your life? Where all the sticks are. Where all the rocks are. And like I said earlier, that if you're an 8.33% person that wants God's best, it's work. I've been, I've been burning limbs day for days. I stack them 10 feet high and burn them. But you know what? I didn't even know they were there until the brush hog came in. But when the brush hog comes in, now I have a whole other choice. You see, we have a choice right now. God has brought a voice into this place. And I believe, how many have been believing for this whole area to change and come to Christ? You know, amen? <clears throat> you, you know where it starts? With a guy that I see in the mirror. That's where it starts. And it's dealing with my own lambs and my own rocks. I'm my own stuff, right? But until sometimes the brush hog comes in and just really, ugh, ah, ugh, <laughs> Hit a rock, lift it up, go into this whole process. That's what these times are like. But you know what? These are the best times of your life, best times of my life. This is where change happens. And this is where harvest comes in. But it starts here. It starts here. Two things. Number one, by chance, there may be someone here you've never received Christ. You've listened to all of the testimonies. Wow. Listen to these people share. And you notice there's one thing in common. Nothing really changed until they met Jesus. So that may be you. And I said to Dave earlier, you know, you don't know what you don't know. But when you come in amongst a, 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 a meeting like this, this is the opportunity. This is your time right now. You just got an invitation from heaven to come into the greatest kingdom that's eternal and you may have gone through the motions, you may have gone to church for who knows how long, but you be honest, you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've never submitted to him. Every head up, every eye open. He would say, Pastor, that's me, and I need prayer. I want to make sure today. Raise your hand. Anyone like that? I want to make sure. I want to make sure. The reason is, this is that's point one where everything changes. So I could be full of believers. That's good. Well, the second thing is this. You know, I was reading where Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 started to preach. Maybe, maybe some Bible scholars in here. What's the first word that came out of his mouth when he started to preach in the book of Matthew? Repent. Very first word. But then he qualified it. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is drawn nigh. Otherwise, he's not just saying repent. Uh, no, I bring help. The kingdom's here now. Kingdom's here now. So <clears throat> let's say that you're here and you've been married once, twice, three, four, five, six, seven times. You know what the Bible says? Though a, seven, th though a, a righteous man falls seven times, he says he will rise. So you've got to rise from right where you are. You have to get past woulda, coulda, shoulda. But you've got to do well right where you are right now. And this is the place of change. And these things that are shared, <clears throat> until you have a time like this where you're invited, you know what? I am going to do something about this. I am going to step up and into what God has for me and my wife and my family. If you'd say, Pastor, that's me, my heart's been spoken to, I believe that the God of heaven is moving right here in our community, right here in our state. I want the change to start with me. Amen? If that's you, stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. That's me.
That's me. This just is, I'm serious about this. This is me. These things that are shared, I'm going to deal with my own sticks and my own rocks and everything that's been expo- exposed in my heart. I'm going to do something about this with the Lord. He's going to show me about the Holy Spirit. I'm going to start some bonfires, and I'm going to have to burn some stuff up in my life. Amen? Now, you that are on your feet, if you'd say, you know what? <clears throat> There's some things that me and my wife, or maybe it's just you, or maybe it's just, no, not your husband, but just the, the wife. If you need prayer, this is what these prayers are here for. There's a lot of prayer. You guys have been praying for this. We've been praying for this. And everybody in this room, you've been prayed for. Don't leave this place. Don't leave this place with something still undone in your heart when you have people right here that can pray with you and agree with you. Amen? You know that the gentleman back here that they took out of here, his name's Tony. He's from my church. He's got the greatest story. He was in a log truck one day. Him and his wife separated. He just, you know, I'm going to... I'm just going to do it my way. Went back into alcohol. Look, he was a Christian. But he got to a place of the prodigal. Come to himself, what am I doing? This is years ago. He made a full U-turn. Him and his wife, wonderful people, right? Here he is. They're coming to a marriage seminar. And he's not going to, but what if he would have went home today? Yeah. Hallelujah, but on all of us here, are we leaving things undone? I tell people in my church, don't get to heaven and find out where you could have been. We have an opportunity right now. Amen? Every head bowed, every head closed. Father, I thank you for Dr. Molina. Thank you for Yvette. Thank you for this team. Thank you for what you've done in our midst, God. Only you can do this by the Holy Spirit. Only you. We're thankful. And Father, as we end this meeting, and I know he'll be back. I know he will, Lord. There's a connection here. As we end this meeting, Lord, we purpose in our hearts, all these that are standing, Lord, lead us, teach us by the Holy Spirit in each unique situation how to embrace the Word of God and the direction of the Holy Spirit to fix those things that we have broken or those things that have been broken around us. Lord, you're big enough. You're big enough. And we thank you for it. Now, if you do need prayer, these people are here. Step out of your seat, if you would, and just come. If you need prayer, as an individual, as a couple, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid sometimes just sharing with somebody else. Hey, this is what's going on in my life. I'm sick of it. I'm going to, you know, step into what God has. Is there anyone like that? Usually the first one, it's like, oh, nobody else is moving. But follow your heart. I learned a long time ago when I was a teenager, whenever my heart would move, I'd move my feet. I went to the altar like every week for like six weeks and got saved every week. My mom said, son, didn't you like do that last week? Well, yeah. <laughs> well, why'd you go again this week? I don't know. My heart's moving. I, I, then I found out, oh, I, I just have to make adjustments. I don't have to get born again, 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 again. Amen. But there may be adjustments that have to be made. Don't, don't be afraid. Just come on up. We're just going to give it a few minutes here. Come on up for prayer. We got Prayers all the way around here. They have been praying, and they are ready to help you if you need that help. Amen, amen. Well, guys, if you will, right up front, just stay. If you all stay. Dave, is there anything else that needs to be covered? Thank you so much for coming. I pray that in the name of Jesus, that a week from now, month from now, six months from now, the fruit of this would continue to grow. Amen. Thank you, team. God bless you. Thank you. You're dismissed. If you need prayer, they're going to be here. If you need prayer, they're going to be here. God bless you guys. Thank you.